Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads Church. We are in our uh, series entitled Fish Tales. This is our third talk in this series. Basically, the big idea is we're taking four fishing, four real fishing stories of Jesus, and, and it's connected with four commands or four um, principles that Jesus wants to teach us to become a strong, good, vibrant follower of Jesus. Amen. So we are in talk number three. The, uh, this morning, the, the title of this morning's message is, Lend Me Your Boat. Lend Me Your Boat. It's in your, the app. It's the, the outline is there. So if you want to make your way there, we can take a look at that here in just a second. We'll be in Luke's Gospel, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 11. Everybody doing okay? Before we get going this morning, a, um, Pastor Joel, first of all, will be here this next month. He'll be teaching on a subject, and then we're going to be hitting Easter here. But uh, this morning, I have a, a really good dear friends of ours, uh, Pastor Brian and Sally Lifesty, who are pastoring a church down in North Point Church in New Braunfels, Texas. So they are also one of our overseers. They're here this morning and just visiting, all right? So if you have any complaints on me, call this guy right here, all right? <laughs> So anyways, uh, you guys have ever had an individual that, um, you know, I, I used to have this young, this guy that would often come to the house and he would lend me, he would ask me for my stuff. Anybody have individuals that come and they, they ask you for your stuff and they, and then you lend them out and then they come back broken. You know, you lend them the lawnmower, comes back with a, you know, the decks all chueco and, and it's, you need a new blade. You lend them your truck. There's, he puts a screw in the tire. Somehow you got to get new tires. You lend them your fishing gear and, you know, you have no strings left and you open the tackle box, it's still full of, you know, stink bait and you got to throw it all away. Anybody have those guys like that? I used to have one and every time um, he would ask me to borrow something, I'd be like, oh man, that's $300. It's $200. I'm like, but I would go ahead and do that. And sure enough, most of the time, stuff like that would happen. So what happens is it, it, it made my heart grow a little bit with hesitation or like, it, it, you know, just kind of messed me up because I want to be open. I want to be liberal. I want to be, you know, life-giving. I want to be open-handed. But stuff like that kind of, you know, I have a tendency to hold on. And, and I can't do that. You know, we're not, we're not called to hold on to stuff. But here's what I know about you. The tendency to hold on to your stuff is in every single one of you, isn't it? We all got to contend with that stuff. And uh, it begins early in the beginning, you know, as you're being raised as a child. It's mine. It's mine. It starts right there. And our parents even egg it on sometimes at Christmas. You know how you have all these uh, presents your, your little kids get? Then you got to go to Aunt Sada's house or something or Grandma's house. And there's other kids involved there. So you don't take all your stuff. And the mom said, he goes, you know, you're going to take this. But remember, when you get over there, that's your stuff. Like, it's mine. So you start having fights and stuff. And then they start punishing you for that. He goes, hey, it's not all yours, share it. I'm like, wait a minute, you just told me it was mine. <laughs> I'm so confused. <laughs> As we get older in the teenage years, um, an adult, you know, that, that kind of stuff creeps in on us. Man, there's something fishy about that person. You become suspicious, you become cautious. And if you're not careful, that kind of a mindset will lead you over, will lead over and carry over into your spiritual walk as well. And it's called wavering faith, where you waver. It's like a bobber. You know the bobber. When you're fishing, you have, I never knew what a bobber was. And then finally somebody said, put this on. It's going to be better for you. But it reminded me of that. You know, the bobber just goes up and down of the waves. It's like the, the waves of emotion. He just kind of goes up and down and up and down. It's never steady and stable. Wavering faith is not good. Wavering faith will always um, weaken your faith and your walk with Jesus. As a matter of fact, this whole idea of wavering is to, is to, it's just not good for your walk. It's not good for your walk at all. You shift back and forth between two positions instead of staying steady in your, in your belief and in your trust. And Jesus, as a disciple, listen, he's the master teacher. He's the rabbi. And uh, he did something to the disciples early on in their walk that he had to address that issue. And he does the same thing in our lives. I tell you that these lessons here from the four fishing stories are challenging to the disciple. But we all have to go through this. He wants us to be not closed-fisted, but open-hearted, but also open-handed. Why? Because the, the, the one thing he wants to build is your faith. 
When he comes back on this earth, he's not going to ask, hey, how many people did you get saved? He goes, how, will he come back and find faith on this earth? So he's constantly wanting us to begin stronger and stronger in our faith and having a wavering faith, undecisive faith, hesitant faith, things that are tentative or uncertain or unsure, that's not good for your walk as a follower of Jesus. But here's what I know about pleasing faith. It always pays when you trust and obey. Faith is what pleases God. It always pays when you trust and obey. Always pays when you trust, and we gotta say it with me, okay? It always pays when you trust. One more time, let's say it louder, it's 11 o'clock. It always pays when you trust. When you trust. You heard the preacher trust. You heard mom and dad trust. But this is your faith. Amen. Will you trust and obey? So we're taking a look at this whole idea in Luke's gospel, the fifth chapter. And it's a, honestly, the way I saw it was, it's almost like a progress. It's almost like a process you go through when you become a follower of Jesus. He's stripping greed from our lives. As a matter of fact, I heard this phrase last night and I wrote it down. God wants to strip you of your greed. He wants to wash you with his seed so he can supply every single one of your needs. It's a process that you go through. Covetousness. That's why he tells a rich young man, he goes, give everything away. Well, Jesus didn't need any of that. What he saw was that covetousness was inside of this man's heart. And hesitant, to be hesitant in your faith, if you're hesitant, always, it always leads to missed opportunities. Hesitancy will. So he wants us to get out of that place and to that place where we just trust and obey. So Luke's gospel, the fifth chapter, let's take a look at that. And I'm just going to kind of share some thoughts that I have in my heart. We'll go home and eat some biscuits and gravy or something. <laughs> Luke 5, 1 through 2. One occasion, Jesus was b- preaching. It reminds me of the old fat Albert ones. Was b- Jesus b- was b- preaching. B- Anybody remember that? <laughs> okay. Anyways, not the point. He's preaching in the crowds on the shore of the Lake Galilee. There was a vast multitude of people pushing to get close to Jesus to hear the word of God. They were doing what, man? They wanted to hear this gospel truth. They were, he's anointed to preach the gospel to the poor, to the brokenhearted, right? And these folks are just, man, there's like something different about this guy. So they were, following, they were pushing to get close to hear uh, Jesus, to hear his word. He noticed two fishing boats at the water's edge. You know, what you'll see this morning is that these are kind of different phases that you will go through as a follower of Jesus. Sometimes when you first begin, you're just at the water's edge. And he's going to try to pull you in a little closer to him, a little deeper with him, and ultimately where you just sell out and you leave everything and follow him. Make sense? But he sees these guys on on the fishing edge there at the water's edge with the fishermen nearby rinsing their nets Rinsing their nets is not very popular, but I mean, it seems like, it's not like you just get, it's not like washing dishes. You just put some dove on there and just wash the nets. It's kind of a dirty job. They've been out there all night. You know, they bring the nets in and some of them didn't have, you know, they didn't have any fish or, but there's all kinds of stuff stuck to that net. There might be a chancla in there. They might be an old license plate or who knows what's in there. Maybe the, 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 the tire your friend messed up or something's in there. So, they're, they're, so, so they're, he sees them rinsing their nets there on the water's edge. Jesus climbs into the boat that belongs to Simon Peter, and he asks him, hey, lend me your boat. Peter, he said, push it off a distance away from the shore so that I can speak to the grounds. He's asking, he goes, hey, listen, you have something that I need. It's for the gospel's sake. It's so that I can share the goodness of God to all of these people. Lend me your boat. No hesitancy. He's not suspicious. Suspicious. As a matter of fact, if you look in chapter four of that passage, uh, he was already in Peter's house earlier, healing his mother-in-law. So uh, that could be a reason why Peter's like, here, man, you healed my mother-in-law. You can have this boat. You shouldn't have done that. I was expecting my inheritance. I don't know, but anyways, Jesus sits down. He begins to teach the people from that boat that was just lent to him. When he finished, he says to Peter, now... He says, launch out your boat into the deep water to cast your nets and you're going to have a great catch. It always pays 
when you trust and obey. Master, Peter replies, he goes, man, we've just come from back from fishing all night and we didn't catch a thing. But if you insist, we'll go out again and let down our nets because of your word. It always pays when you trust and obey. Verse six and seven, you know, the scripture talks about whenever you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord and the Lord will repay it back. And so Jesus is just trying to repay. He's just trying to be who he is. That's who he is. He's not trying to take stuff away from you just to make you all sad and like, well, I'm suffering for Jesus. It's like Lent season. You're in Lent season. Some of you guys are fasting. Well, it's, I can't eat meat. Don't focus on what you're not getting. Focus on what he's doing inside of you. You know what I'm saying? And so, so they pulled up their nets and they were shocked to see this huge catch of fish. So much that their nets were ready to burst. They waved to their business partners. Hey, why don't they come here? And they asked for their boats for help. And they ended up completely filling both boats and their business partners and their friends as fishermen. And they were full of fish until their boats began to sink. Isn't that crazy? It always pays to trust and obey. And when Simon Peter sees this astonishing miracle, I love this. He kneels at Jesus' feet. He probably had just heard the message of hope. He'd probably just heard the gospel being preached as he saw the multitudes. He saw this guy walking in. He hears a message, lend me this boat. And it's like, throw this out there. Man, we've been out there all night, but nevertheless, it's your word. I'll do this. And then he's overwhelmed. He comes back and he falls on his knees. He says, get away from me, master, for I am a sinful man. He goes, I can't pay this back to you. Who am I that I get all this? Simon Peter, the other fishermen, including his fishing partners, Jacob and John, the sons of Zebedee, were awestruck over the miracle catch of the fish. And Jesus answered, and I love this passage. I never saw this. So he comes back, they're overwhelmed, they're bowing down, and he says, don't yield to your fear. Just don't you dare be afraid of my father's goodness. Don't be afraid of, of lending me anything, of, of trusting me, of obeying me. Yeah. I've got something good for you. Amen. Trust me. Obey me. From now on, you'll catch men for salvation. And man, that was enough. Pulling their boats to the shore, they left everything. They left their boat. Brand new. Everything behind and followed Jesus. Isn't that a great story? Yes. Okay, let's go home. Let's pray. In this passage, I really want to just use verses, I think, 3, 4, and 11. And here's the process you'll see. The big idea is this, is that he'll, he says, lend me your boat. Then he says, launch out, launch that boat out into the deep. And then he says, leave that boat. As a matter of fact, he didn't say it. But you get overwhelmed with God's goodness because you're obeying and trusting in those first two. You can't but just say, you know what, I'm, I'm sold out. I'm going all in. And I love that. And all of us here in this room, we're in one of those phases. Some of us are on the water's edge. Just looking on, you know, shopping, do that shopping window, window shopping. I heard about these Jesus guys. I heard about that Crossroads Church. I heard they handled snakes on Wednesdays. <laughs> You're on the water's edge wondering. He's trying to pull you in. Some of us are in that stage where, man, we've sold out, we've given our hearts to Christ, but we are still grieving because of our old thinking. He's wanting us to, hey, lend me this. It's for the gospel's sake. It's for my kingdom. It's bigger than you. Yeah. Yeah. So There's some of us who've gone, we've opened our hearts, and we're, we're open-handed, and he's saying, hey, I want to take you deeper. In that deeper place, there's, there's some beautiful riches that I want you to see that you can't see unless you're willing to launch out into that deep area. And for some of us, the calling of God's upon our lives. The dream is so, we're impregnated with the thing that God puts inside of us. But we're stuck, why? Because we're, we're, we're thinking about plan B. Because plan A seems too risky. He says, leave it. If you want to follow me, take up the cross. Go, let's go. Does that make sense? So we'll use that as an outline. Number one, here's the deal. Take a step forward. Lend him your boat. 
He says, when he came there, he said, lend me your boat. He wants us, he's always trying to pry uh, things out of us that are, we hold on to closely to live free. I don't know about you, but some of you guys know who are walking with the Lord for a while. You got to sacrifice some of this stuff. You got to lend him a lot of things. And you do it pleasingly because you understand that it always pays to trust and obey. Give me your wife. I'm married to her. Give me your wife. She's not yours. She's mine before she was ever yours. Give me your oldest daughter. Give me this church. This isn't yours. I started this. You just said yes. <laughs> it's all his. Amen. It's all his. Thank God. But the first steps, take a step forward and lend him your boat. You and I have to be willing to lend him our boat. When Jesus looks at Peter, he sees the multitudes. And he sees that they were tired. He sees that they were unfulfilled. He sees that they had been out all night struggling. Now he's there mending their nets. You know, and there's trap fish and there's all kinds of stuff going on in that fish there. You know, it's, it's more, they got to go home. If there's a catch, they would go sell it stuff, get some money, then start back the next day. And there's all kinds of stuff that are happening there. He sees them, but Peter also recognizes him. But you know what Jesus do? Do's. You know what Jesus does? You know what Jesus does when he sees you in your regular routine or in your failed position or in your whatever it you're frustrated about? You know what Jesus does in those moments? He's going he's gonna to do something. He's going he's gonna to call you out to lend him something. He's going to call you out in those places. Because if you're not careful, the failure, the past stuff, the stuff that didn't go according to your own way, you get stuck right there. He didn't want you to get stuck. He didn't want you to waver. He didn't want you to be hesitant. He wants you to move forward. And one of the ways he helps you to move forward is like, hey, lend me this. I need this for the gospel's sake. I don't know what this is. It could be that extra car that you got in the garage. Hey, give that to pastor. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't do that. I don't need your car. I'm not saying I don't need your car, okay? Got all that acreage. Lend me that acreage. For the gospel's sake. I don't know what that is. In my life, I could sit there. He's asking me to lend him cars and suits and whatever. He's going to ask you for your lawnmower. Just give it to him. It's like, no. <laughs> he says, lend me your boat. He calls us out. And Peter could have easily focused on what he didn't have. But he chose to move on that opportunity right there that was before him. Why? Because it always pays to trust and obey. Peter sees the multitudes, and all of a sudden, this rabbi is sitting there, and all these people are following him. He hears the message of the gospel, and he sees all these people pushing and shoving, and he walks into this guy, he walks into Peter's boat. Hey, lend this to me. You know, sometimes the gospel is free, right? But it demands everything in our lives. I told you that last week. The gospel's free, but it demands everything. We want everything from God that God has for us, that God wants to offer us. We want, every, we want the blessings. Why? Because we're those kind of people. But we want it without giving anything up. And that's not true discipleship. We want to buy in without selling out. Ultimately, in the kingdom of God, the kingdom thinking is this. You ultimately lose whatever you decide to keep. Isn't that the truth? And you ultimately keep whatever you decide or you're willing to let go of. That is so powerful. And so a kingdom mindset, and this is what he's wanting to do. That's why he wants to pry that stuff out. It's different with God's kingdom and earthly kingdom. Like I said a minute ago, in Proverbs says, if you, if you uh, give to the poor, those that are broken, those that are hurting, it says we, it's almost as if though you're lending to the Lord. And God, listen to this. God will never allow anyone, he will never be indebted to anyone. We don't owe him any, no one can ever say, he goes, I gave you this, but look, we owe him everything. Amen, he doesn't owe us anything. And that's what a kingdom, there's another passage in Proverbs the 11th chapter that says it this way. There's one who scatters, one who's willing to let go, and that person increases. 
But there is another one who decides to withhold more than is right, but that person, it leads him to, to poverty. It says the generous soul, the generous soul will be made rich. Isn't that good? Yes. And who, who, he who waters will himself be watered also. It's a principle in the kingdom of God. Isn't that great? Yes. So lend them your boat. Whatever it is. There's a quote by um, C.S. Lewis. When he was talking about giving and charities or whatever. I don't know if you guys have that C.S. Lewis quote there. If our charities do not at all pinch or hamper us, in other words, if our giving doesn't hurt a little bit, for some of us, our giving is just like, it's like a bill. Just write another bill. Just write another check. It should hurt us a little bit. He said, if it doesn't have a pinch or hamper us, I should say that they are too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot do because our charitable expenditures exclude them. Isn't that powerful? I love that about him. <clears throat> he's going to ask you to lend him. As a matter of fact, he's speaking right now. He's asking you to lend him something. Here's a question. What are you holding on to that he wants you to lend out? What are you holding on to? So the first step is, listen, lend him your boat. The second one is this. So launch your board out, your boat out a little bit deeper. Take a stride. First, you're taking a step. Then you're going to take a stride to go out a little bit deeper. There's some beautiful things that happen in your life when you go out deeper with Jesus. Amen? Amen. He said to Peter, he goes, hey, Peter, thanks for your willingness to lend me this boat. But now let's go out a little bit further. Thank you for lending that to me. I'm going to repay you. And Peter's like, listen, you're the teacher. I'm the fisherman. Right? I've been out all night. I'll listen to you teach. You listen. We don't fish in the daytime. We fish at nighttime. There's all this self-effort, you know, his self-esteem is getting crushed at that moment and he's pinching it and he's poking at it. He goes, hey, go out a little bit deeper because there in that deep place, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something so real. And so he takes him out. You know, in our walk with Jesus, he's always, he's always constantly challenging our hearts to go a little bit deeper. <clears throat> he's not trying to take away from us. He wants to bless us. He wants to help us. He wants to help, help us have strong faith. And in my life personally, let me just say this, there are three things that he challenges me constantly. I've been walking with him now for whatever, 37 years. In the area of my finances, in the area of my friends or friendship, and in the area of my faith, constantly. It never stops and it never will. Like, man, I'm doing good. My goal is to try to be the number one giver in our church. I haven't done it yet. It's like, ah. Oh. One, I ain't got that kind of money. <laughs> but he's just challenging me. These, he's challenging me in my friendship. Why? Because I'm a hermit. I, it's easy for me to just stay home by myself and study or do whatever. It's like, I need you to go talk to someone. No, Jesus. Let me send one of the elders. <laughs> Right? And then once he just, man, you find he's like, oh man, Daniel, Aubrey, they're going to be awesome people. Then he's like, I'm leaving now. I'm moving. Like he, oh. so you stop. You don't want to go further the next time. You don't want to get close the next time. But man, I'm telling you, he's constantly prying our hearts open to just trust and stay innocent because they're not yours anyway. They're his. What's that saying that we have, babe? Um, we hold their heart closely, but we hold their hand loosely. If they come our way, man, God brings them for a reason. And I hold them wholeheartedly. But as soon as he says, hey, I'm sending them over here on this mission, I got to let them go. They're not mine anyways. And I don't know him anything. He's putting them on a mission. Does that make sense? Launch deeper. Some of you guys are stuck in a place. He wants you to go a little bit deeper. It could be in the area of your finances. Trust me. It could be in the area of your relationships. Hey, let that person go. They're toxic to you. You've already tried their toxic. Let them go. Make, make sense? Yes. <clears throat> the third thing, 
what takes place is he goes from lending to launching to leaving it. Burn that boat. Thank you, Daniel. It says after he goes out there and launches, he gets rewarded and he's so overwhelmed that he says, man, I'm leaving everything. I'm going to go and follow and be with him. Don't yield to your fears, what Jesus told him. There are times in our walk, and I'll close with this, that God wants you to draw a line in the sand. He puts you right there. He's like, hey, choose you this day. And for many of us, like I said a minute minute ago, plan B is so comfortable that that becomes our plan A. Plan A is so risky that we're not willing to go with him to those places and leave it all behind and we just hold on to plan B. Now, no condemnation here, okay? But some of us are in that transition. We want to see the second step before we take the first step. Does that make sense? And you got to abandon. Sometimes you got to draw a line in the sand. You got to put your, 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 your son on the altar like Abraham did. You, you got to step out of the boat like Peter did. You got to get your staff that God gave you. You got to throw it like Moses did. You got to draw a line somewhere. And when he tells you to do that, you are in a crossroads. And he's asking you, hey, trust me. Why? Because it always pays to trust and obey. There's a passage of scripture in Isaiah that says, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Amen. Amen. So the ultimate leap is for you to leave that boat, to die. Hernando, Hernandez Cortez, you guys have heard this story before. In uh, 1519, a Spanish explorer who wanted to, uh, he's a conquistador, and he wanted to seize the treasure that the Aztecs had for over 600 years. Six, these guys were structured, they were embedded in their belief system, they were there, and this guy wanted to go out there and take over that treasure. So what does he do? He takes 11 ships, 13 horses, 110 sailors, 553 soldiers, and he lands there on the shores of the Yucatan. And then he sits there, he goes, hey, we're going to take these guys on. But what he didn't know is that there's over 5 million of them there. So the odds were amazingly against him. As a matter of fact, I did the math, 7,541 to 1 odds. Seems impossible, right? <laughs> Some of his men freaked out once they saw that there were so many and they were overwhelmed with all that. So they took off. They tried to rip their, the ships off to go back to Cuba because they were loyal to Cuba. They got word of it and they captured them and he puts them in front and he gives a command to everyone. He goes, go burn those ships. <laughs> in other words, listen, we're all in. Well, how are we going to go back? Well, if we're going to go back on a ship, we're going to go back on their ships because we're going to conquer them. And that's the thing about Cortez. Everybody knew and understood that he was all or nothing at that time. And there are times in our lives that you got to burn those things in the past. you got to leave that stuff behind in order to gain new ground ahead in your life and your legacy. you got to draw a line in the sand. If Peter were to walk in here this morning and be your mentor for just a few minutes, here's what Peter would tell you. He goes, listen, crossroads, lend him your boat. And if he asks you to launch deeper, trust him. Launch out deeper. If he wants you to leave that, leave it all behind. Why? Because it always pays when you trust and obey. So this home, I decided, this, this, this week I decided to, for you to take something home. And it's there in your notes, but I just want to go through it real quick. You know, every boat has a name, right? We, we came up with some funny names as we're driving around. There are some boats Out there, you know how they have those names? Sea therapy. There was another one that says, she got the house. (laughs) There's another one that said, cirrhosis of the river. (laughs) Aquaholic. This is like the craziest stuff. I love this other one. It said, in a meeting. (laughs) I thought that was genius. But if Jesus were to walk through these doors and asked if he could borrow something for the sake of the gospel, what would that be in your life? Maybe it is that extra room that you have upstairs. Maybe it is that, you know, the garage, the the, the extra bike that you have in your your garage. 
Maybe it is, ladies, those extra shoes that you have in your closet. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a tractor that you have you could use for the gospel's sake. Maybe it's a ranch you could give out to the teenagers. Maybe it's a ski boat. I don't know what it is, but what is it in your life? Maybe it's just business sense or gardening sense or cooking sense or fishing sense. Do you have a bunch of kids running around here without any, you know, without any dads? Man, it'd be awesome for you guys as, as older gentlemen to come in and it's like, hey, I want to take your son fishing. Will you go with me? And that'd be powerful. If you were to walk in here, name the boat that you're willing to lend. The second one is this. I've been challenged by myself, you know, this week because I've been up in New Mexico and we were in three or four inch ice and all you saw was white and it was beautiful, snow was coming down and this is all I had to do was just study about this. And I'm challenged with these saying, Marcus, here's what I want you to lend. Marcus, here's what I want you to launch. Here's the name of the boat that I need you to launch now. Here's the name of the boat that I need you to leave now. Man, I'm like, Jesus, why did I come to New Mexico? <laughs> I felt like my heart's open-handed. You know, everything's his. Nothing's mine. But there's always something more. He's always stretching us. It's not that he's satisfied. He loves you too much to leave you that way. Isn't that good? Name the boat you're willing to launch. Maybe it's in these areas that I talked about earlier. Maybe it's in the area of your finances. Maybe it's an area of your friends. Maybe it's an area, I don't know what that is. You know, but name the boat. Take your time this week. Don't just rush it like if it's here, A, I got an A. <laughs> the last one, much like Peter, you know, when Jesus told Peter to launch out deeper, some pride had to leave. Self-effort. And he had to leave that part to go back to the same place of his failure and trust God. <laughs> Only this time there was a different, different outcome, wasn't it? He obeyed him at his word and he went out there. I love that. Name the boat you're willing to leave. I know in my life, I had to leave rejection. That was the name of my boat. I had to leave the name addiction. I had to leave the name not enough. I had to leave those names. In order for me to move forward in my, in my walk with him, that ship had to burn. That boat had to burn. Otherwise, I could never cross over to this place. And in your life, some of us are stuck right there. There's a label, there's a name that's in your boat, that you have on your boat that got you stuck. It says, burn that thing. Leave it all to follow me. I got greater riches for you if you just trust and obey. Amen. Amen. There was a young man um, by the name of Edward Kimball, now I'll close with this story, who was just a good dry, uh, uh, what do you call it, dry good salesman. He was a salesman. <clears throat> and oh, his church asked him to become a Sunday school teacher. He goes, hey, I need your gift as a teacher. Come help us out with Sunday school. And so he goes out and teaches Sunday school and he takes a liking to this one guy named Dwight. And Dwight, man, he was a really cool kid, but his heart just fell in love with this kid and he was sharing the message of truth to him. And this kid, Dwight, came from, he was like the sixth child in the family. He only had like a fifth or sixth grade education. He got bored going out there on the farm. So at the age of 17, he leaves his home, his, his parents and everyone. He goes to another place with his uncle. Well, his uncle has a shoe shop. He asked him to work there. So he starts working there on one condition. He has to go to church. So he goes to this church where this man, Edward Kimball, who was just an old salesman, who lent his gift to the Lord, was teaching Sunday school in his age group. And so while he's working in the shoe shop, this man, this teacher, the Sunday school teacher, goes over there to him, and he has a heart, he has a burden for him, so he preaches the gospel to him. And this young man, Dwight, gives his life to Christ. Now, we know him as Dwight right here, but you guys know him as Dwight D.L. Moody, the one that started the Moody Institute. Isn't that powerful? What's more powerful is this, is that Moody was responsible to lead F.B. Meyer to the Lord. F.B. Meyer was responsible to lead Wilbur Chapman to the Lord. Wilbur Chapman uh, led Billy, was Billy Sunday to the Lord. 
Billy Sunday led Mordecai Ham to the Lord. Mordecai Ham led, guess who? Billy Graham to the Lord Jesus Christ. All because a little Sunday school teacher was willing to lend him that gift. Amen. Amen. What about us? What are you willing to lend him? What are you willing to launch? What are you willing to leave? Does that make sense? Let me pray with you. Father, we are so thankful. We're so grateful for all that you have in our lives. And God, I know that you've put us in a place where we could develop strong faith. That's our desire. That's, our, that's what we desire, Lord God, to be one with you. And we also know that according to your word, there's things that we need to lend out. There's things that we need to launch deeper into. There's things that we need to leave behind. So I pray for us to have ears to hear this morning so that we could get to that place of full commitment, of full surrender. We draw the line in the sand. We burn those things behind us. We press forward to your ultimate calling in Christ Jesus. We trust you in that. In Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said, amen. amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.